Hello everyone, welcome back to a new video. Today we're going to be having a look at Zest PVZ and just have a really an in-depth look to see what makes him so special in this matchup, why he tends to win so much and I guess just in general, you know, what what makes Zest Zest. So a lot of the time we see Zest open up with a, uh, a pylon scout or a pre-pylon scout, so sending one of his first probes across the map to try and block the natural. Uh, he's playing against Sue this time, and Sue went for a 14 hatch, which always will allow you to get the hatchery down as a Zerg at a small economical cost. So, even though Zest did attempt to block that natural, it, it didn't succeed. We're going to be looking at two games from Zest, where he plays a similar build order. We're going to be looking at the follow-ups, the responses, the... Hopefully, I'll be able to figure out the reasons why he does certain things. Sometimes it can be a bit difficult to figure that out with Zest, but he he's a very systematical player. So a lot of the time, the games will follow a certain path and certain things trigger certain responses. So if you can figure out those responses in, in Zest his play, a lot of the time he's going to be easier to counter. And also, he's going to be really nice to copy because he already has a lot of stuff figured out. He, when he, when he plays the same build order a lot, it usually means that he's very confident and that this build order is, is the best or at least the most stable, as he really likes playing the same thing again and again. So, what we're going to be looking at is a triple DT drop, um, which is faking a Glaive Adept. I have a build order to that. I hopefully have it linked somewhere up here and perhaps even in the description, but we'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, and, and this build order is is basically what I just said it is. It's you, you fake going for a Glaive Adept build, so you get four early Adepts, and then you go into a 3 gate uh, DT. Most of the time you warp them into the main base. You can also warp them in front and then split up every single DT. That's the more risky approach, but the, the one in the main is relatively safe. Um, and, and has a lot of similarities with a regular DT group. So, yeah, the, the, the builder, like I said, Hopefully, I, I managed to put it down somewhere, so you guys will be able to figure it out if you haven't seen it before. So we're gonna just skip through that, skip through that phase a little bit, and mainly gonna be looking at is unit movement, um, things like follow-ups, um, yeah, and, and then from there the, the overall game plan that Zest seems to have in this matchup. So he moves out to the force for Clave Adepts. He puts out a shade. Y you can go all the way through with that shade, right? You can you can finish your shade. You can keep going on the reason he goes back is because he sees an overlord in his main he's like okay i'm gonna kill that overlord and then i'm gonna keep my adepts at home um he didn't find any links on the map so it's like i probably won't get spotted uh, you see a lot of links on the way so does not have spores yet so that's you know pretty bad for him so this means that Sue fell for the bait basically he's like all right this is this is good for zest and Zest, of course, isn't aware of that. So if you're Zest, only at this point do you realize, holy crap, there's not a spore. This is very good for me. Now, what Zest doesn't know if is there, is there a spore over here at the natural? Is there a spore at the third? So you could say, well, doesn't he just instantly win the game if he sends one DT over here and one DT over here? Probably, yeah. In this game, he probably would. But there's a good chance there's going to be at least a single spore somewhere, just in case it is 3k DT, and a lot of the time even two spores. So in that case, you're just sending two DTs into their deaths, and you're going to be able to do a lot less damage. What Zest is doing right now is the most consistent play. It's the play that gets guaranteed damage in, um, either in the form of a hatchery or just a couple of drones and a lot of delayed mining time. And the way that Zest plays this is actually really quite cool. So what he does is... Instead of being like, okay, I want to get this hatchery, he's aware of the possibility that a spore is already finished, and it's it, he wants to move up to save this hatchery. So what does Zest do? He puts two DTs on hold position on the ramp, forcing the spore to first burrow close to the ramp, and only then capable of going up. Now, Zest kind of admits with this play that he almost never is going to be able to get this hatchery, but he's gonna be able to deny mining time for a very long time of this base, and perhaps in a good situation might even be able to get the hatchery. So he sees this war go down, and some slight miss micro by him, I have to admit here, loses two DTs, um, but still actually, or one DT, sorry, still actually manages to, to get the hatchery. Um, we'll lose, I think, most of his DTs for it, so it's not the best trade, and the, the the end of this execution wasn't great, but the general plan was really cool, right? He's just looking for consistent damage over 
trying, you know, it, being very optimistic and be like, oh, there's probably no spores here. No, he's like, all right, I know now there's no spore in the main. Let me just try to get as much damage consistently as I can. Um, and he did a pretty good job of that. I mean, he gets a hatchery, did deny a lot of mining time, killed a bunch of workers as well. Obviously losing, well, what was it? Three, three DTs and an Archon isn't the ideal scenario, but I still appreciate the moves that he made there. I, I think the the ideas behind it were all very good. Now, follow-up is going to be uh, charge. I believe that had he not killed that hatchery, that he would have followed up with Blink. Now, the reason for that is that the moment your opponent has a pretty good eco against a build like this, is that Muta is a very common response. So then Blink as a follow-up, is, is something that we see a lot from the top players. So, now, Zest um, is pretty persistent in his harassment. So, after losing the, the first prism with a couple of DTs, he decides it's still time for some Archon harass, trying to put on some pressure, which I kind of like. And this is this is something you'll see a lot from Zest. Even if he loses his first prism, hell, he can lose two prisms in the early game and he'll still keep going with his harass. Like, he finds it so important to keep some type of pressure on his opponent that he almost always will have something on his opponent's side of the map, sorry. So obviously is, is kind of ready for that, but this situation is good for Zez, right? He gets another, actually I don't think that was a cancel, I think there might have been a kill on that hatchery, I'm not entirely sure. Um, Zez just keeps some pressure on behind it, he gets Archons, he gets Zealots, and he plays a style which usually requires pretty late storm um, his upgrades are going to be a little bit delayed as well and uh, sometimes we'll see fast gases sometimes we, we see slow gases if we see slower gases on his third base a lot of the time we'll see big eight gate pushes um, sometimes nine or ten gate um, this usually indicates the gases is that he at least wants to get a couple more gas units whether that be more dts or more archons or more templars and faster storm that can always be decided after seeing what the Zerg goes for, but th yeah, there's, there's really just two major ways to to go from an opening like he did, where you either go on 4 gas and you push very hard off of 8 gate, or you go into a more sophisticated army with higher gas count, and that's what he's going to do right now, so we're still seeing that blink, and um, the initial charge of course is, is helpful for harassment, and perhaps for counter attacks, if you get some kind of attack against you and it's also very very helpful um, of, of course just in general fights if you don't want to do some push usually charge loss are a little bit better than stalkers now this blink is most likely made either for well actually just for muralisk most likely in case there is a mural transition we see cannons going down in every base as well this is just a safety precaution where zest realizes that it's going to be hard for him to consistently get a scout off on a spire or just any kind of tech switch so it's like all right one cannon per base blink these are my safety measures i'm not necessarily gonna warp in 10 15 stalkers i'm just gonna have it ready so if nine mutalists show up i should be able to be like okay i can warp in six stalkers here i have a cannon in each base i'm fine now a, a lot of people will ask me here well what if 25 mutalists show up the thing is that the moment sue has the time to save up for 25 mutalists a player like zest majority of the time will be able to realize this and kill his opponent in that window because 2.5k 2.5k is a lot of resources especially in such a low eco game you see both players on low economy um, this kind of stuff usually is only re really viable for zerk if they're either on eight or maybe even on 10 gases but so far Sue has only been on six gas and saving 2500 gas with that while staying alive is a is a rough task to put it lightly now, we see Zest being actually kind of patient and very passive. But as I said before, he always keeps a prism on the other side of the map. Now, this prism forces two things. Or it not forces two things, it does two things. So first of all, it can deny creep. It can perhaps pick off a, a, a drone or an overlord that is spotting somewhere. As a result, we see the map vision of Sue is extremely poor because this prism has been flying around for so long. Creep spread isn't that great. There's no links scattered around the map. There's no overlord here. There's no overlord here. No links over here. So the vision of Sue is really just limited to the creep to for him that is alive. So any kind of move out he is doing, he will be completely unaware 
of where a zest army currently is. There could be five zealots hidden here, there could be five zealots hidden here, hell, there could be a complete army hidden here, uh, and then ten zealots here. Like, there's lots of things that you can do, of course, if your opponent doesn't have vision. Another thing that this prism does, being on the opponent's side of the map already, the moment zest realizes that Sue is moving out, he can go in for a counter attack. Um, which most likely will get be unspotted once again because of number one. There is almost no map vision for Sue. So these are just things that, that are really nice to follow in, as, as a general rule. And we'll see. Um, now Sue will have somewhat of a dilemma here because he, he sees this prism. And if Zest decides to warp in 10 zealots here, all of a sudden this attack by Sue that is just meant as a fourth cancel attack, right? This this attack is unlikely to kill a third base with a couple of batteries, couple of storms into a small choke. This attack is gonna be completely fine against a fourth base that is, that is not really well established. So the goal of this attack for Su is hopefully to catch Zest army out. And if not, just to cancel the fourth base and then go home, bank on the fact that you have your own third, your own fourth base, you're up in, in, in workers, up in economy, and then perhaps start tacking to a hive and a greater spire. Now, the moment he sees this prism, there is a possibility he goes back home to defend that. Because what if Zest puts this in warp in mode, warps in 10 zealots? Now, Sue isn't very afraid. He's like, all right, <laughs> you know what, I'm gonna go and Zest as a response to that, it's like, eh, maybe I can't actually hold. So he'll just go back with the prism. But you see there's possibilities here where at least you're confusing your opponent or the, the, op the opposing Zerg player. And you're um, basically making him scared to move out at all times. So Zest right now realizes that most likely he won't be able to defend his fort. Well, actually, he's kind of going to defend his fort base. I thought he was going to be less committal, less committed here. What I would have liked here from Zest is that the warp he just had at his fourth base, if that was on the other side of the map with these two Archons. Like he's still gonna get a, actually gonna get a big ar warp in here with the Archons, I kinda do like that. So then he kinda gives up the fourth base and he's like, all right, you get my fourth, I get your fourth. How about that as a play? And Sue is like, well, I, I don't actually like that too much because Zerg does want to be up in eco, especially when playing Rosaline Bane. Um, so yeah, Zest mo mo most likely is, I mean, he doesn't get the base, but the thought behind it was pretty good. I just wish he would have done it a bit faster and uh, given up this fourth base for it a little bit quicker. So really just this prism provides so much value uh, in the way of counterattacks, basically always forcing Su to either have an all-in attack or to attack have an attack where a lot of supply is missing because he's preemptively defending at home, right? Like if you want to deal with two Archons and a potential eight zealot warp in, Honestly, you're gonna need to leave 15, 16 roaches at home, or maybe 10 roaches and 5 queens always in position. And if not, you're just gonna be taking damage, like basically like this. And even if you have a lot of supply at home, you can see Archon still can do a fair amount of damage. And one warp in here would be able to maybe get this base still. Now, once again, we see Sue being able to cancel that fourth base. What I really like out of Zest here is really just his patience in being like okay you killed my fourth base that's okay as long as i don't lose any of my or any as long as i don't lose the majority of my expensive units so your archons your immortals your storms as long as i keep those alive and i keep building on those i'm fine losing mineral structures i'm fine losing zealots i just don't want you to get a very good eco yourself and i don't want you to kill any of my gas units that's all Zest really wants he doesn't want big losing fights and he doesn't want the economy of his opponent to grow out of control so every single time uh, we see Sue move out we see zealots going in zealots are just a mineral unit only so they don't really stunt the growth of his core army um, the, the thing with zealots is the difference between 50 zealots in your army and 10 zealots in your army I mean, there is a difference there, but it's not massive because Banelings are gonna be able to deal with both 50 and with 10 Zealots about as effectively. So a lot of the time, these um, these kinds of armies, they really, the, the most important part is this, this core part, the gas units, the, the Immortals, the Archons, the Templar, perhaps even the Sentries. Um, these are the units that will be doing the damage and that will uh, decide whether a fight will be winning or losing. So assessed, seemingly is throwing away zealots every now and then these zealots just need to do damage once or twice for them to be worth it and 
they just killed this base with a couple of DTs and now he kills this base with salads and he's gonna be completely fine with this because he knows that he can keep growing this army the moment his opponent moves out he'll go in again with a couple of zealots and Cess will be like okay you want to take my fort base down again that's completely fine now all of a sudden my core army from what it was before was maybe three archons and 12 zealots now i'm still only at 150 supply so maybe it's similar supply but all of a sudden we have seven archons we have two immortals we have four templar with full energy so the situation is improving every single time these move outs by sue happen and you might say well this is like the fifth time he's gonna lose his fourth base sure that's true but Cess doesn't actually care as long as he doesn't lose his army he's just building on top of an army that's gonna get bigger and bigger um, and you, you see he's really only caring very much about this fort basically once again big run by so this time a little more prepared as queens uh, set and, and 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 spore and uh, or well an overseer sorry queens roach in an overseer in position and managed to deal with it once again Sest absolutely keeps everything alive still has seven archons um, he has a lot of zealots here now at home as well so in case he does ever get attacked he will he'll keep these zealots basically as, a, as an ace up his sleeve he's like all right if you ever do commit you throw all your banelings into my archons i can send in the zealots after that so let's have a look at what happens now now sue's mining still isn't great but he's getting back up to four bases and the moment sue leaves what does our good friend says do well he's probably gonna take a fourth base again isn't he taking his time but yeah there we go takes his fourth base again sue tries to go in again we have a big salad move out where once again this is gonna force units to stay at home this is gonna force sue to not completely focus on these attacks and now we're getting to a point where one might start to wonder is it possible for zest to actually have a fight at his fourth base at this point because right now we have what well this is a lot of archons i think this is 12 archons we have three immortals, but we don't have storm. So you could say perhaps if the zealots are fighting at home as well, and all these archons and, uh, and immortals are in a good position, that Zest, there might actually be a possibility for Zest to have a good fight. He still has one guy with storm available, and now all of a sudden he has 180 supply, and about 160 supply of that is core army. So we went from about 110 supply to earlier when I said 140 supply, and now we really have a, a, a big amount of core units, the core units being units that are in zealots, um, that are really gonna boost the army strength in these kind of engagements. So we see more zealots just being used for, for run buys, DTs being used for run buys. And the only reason for this is, is because basically Zest wants this army to split up, especially he wants the roaches to go fight with these uh, zealots. That's ideal. Because there's not that many banelings right now, so I think this can't be defended with just banelings. And for, for about 15 zealots, you're going to need about 15 or 16 roaches. And then all of a sudden, this army is a lot smaller. Zest has a pretty decent shot at winning a fight here. Mm. I'm not quite sure what this run by is doing exactly, but you see a couple of decent storms here being thrown down. And all of a sudden, even though it felt like Su was pretty much in control this entire game... Um, all of a sudden Sue is losing a base here. This honestly wasn't the greatest the greatest trade deal in the history of trade deals though by Zest. Um, I, I liked the idea behind it, but the execution is a little lacking in the sense that this run by over here, it shouldn't have been walking into this area. It should have been going here and been going here. These areas are further away from where your main army is attacking, meaning that the retreat path for roaches is longer, so a, l a higher likelihood of doing damage. And also it gives you just more time to respond to him switching between armies. Uh, on top of that, if you see 15 ravagers attacking 10 zealots, perhaps just move the, the zealots back to the right side as your main army is attacking this. But yeah, th this base was still completely mining, so I think the run by could have done a bit more, but once again, the general idea behind it is the most important thing. Now, once again, Zella, uh, or, or Zest, just building on his core army, 10 Archons, 3 Immortals, 6 Templar, and once these bad boys have Storm, um, it's becoming kind of difficult to imagine a fight in which Su actually can get a win, right? I mean, we see, what, 10 Banelings, Majority, Ravagers, Roaches, and this this army containing a lot of gas units here for Zest is so big at this point that it almost feels 
impossible for Shu in a way to get good fights now and we've now reached a point where the moment that Su moves out, not only does he expose himself to run buys, and as a result he's leaving, what what's this, like 20 supply at home, 20, 22 supply, wish I could count, that's 9 units, that's 18 supply at home, um, and even if he had that 18 supply here, he probably wouldn't be able to win this fight straight up. And Zest realizes, and this is the first time we, say, we see Zest in a defensive posture where he starts defending his outside base. Remember, before he was always in this little choke, being all, all bunched up, making sure that nothing can come through here. But now it's like, okay, let's fight. Let's clash. I think I can do it. And upgrade-wise, he's slightly ahead. Um, that's a mistake by Sue, of course. Should have had plus two already. But Zest played, th this is the fight that Zest has been working towards all game long, where he was just building and building on that army. We went from 3 Archons to 6 to, to 10, and then we went to 12 Archons with those 5 Templars. Well, and this is the army that Zest wanted. Now he has the fight that he wants, he prepared for it. There's no run by for the first time as well, meaning that this army of Su is lacking 18 supply, and Zest has completely orchestrated this entire game to just come down to this fight. And then all he needs to do is do this fight decent enough. So we see the zealots in the back, we see the storms landing on the banes, and an absolute crush of this fight, complete destruction, where the setup, the setup of the fight was good, the execution of the fight was good, but the, the setup towards the fight, the way he orchestrated Sue to push into him one more time, and then he finally was ready, I think that's the real takeaway from this game, where he just basically has been setting up the entire game for this one fight and he's just been stalling and stalling for this one moment making sure a that Su couldn't tag to a better army by keeping his drone count low and b by never overextending in his defense always keeping this fort base uh basically as a throwaway fort because he knew his opponent was on low drone count and this was really a, a beautiful display of patience and and just in general of, of long-term thinking uh in this game so he's, he's, he's gonna send one more run by in i mean at this point his supply is so much bigger that he could have everything in one clump and probably still win the game move commanding into banelings but uh yeah, he's gonna play it out properly which all of you should as well may i add uh yeah this this really is a well, it was a fantastic show i think of uh of how you want to be playing pvz opening with either dt drop or even a glaive adapt where uh, a lot of the time, uh, uh, your army doesn't really consist of that many heavy gas units because your economy just isn't as good as when you play something like Stargate, where you need to stall less and it's more about being in position and and that kind of stuff. Here it's more about about stalling the game out for you to get that that storm, to get the you know the extra archons, the extra immortals out. So very cool first game. Let's uh, hop into the second game that I have prepared as well and and see how he deals. Uh, yeah, with a slightly different situation, with a, a different early game. All right. Once again, we have this fast uh, scout by Zest, which is uh, really just intended to block the natural. I think this game, this I, I got both games from a best of three that was recently played in the Oli Molik, which if you want, you can support on Patreon, patreon.com slash Oli Molik. You can get the replays, I believe, if you pay maybe five or three dollars a month. I always do it, support a, a nice community grown tournament and uh, you get some beautiful replays to boot. Um, I'm not sure if this game was played earlier or if the, the last game was played earlier um, because Sue doesn't go for a 14 hatchery here, which is a, is a bit suspect if you if you know your opponent is gonna pro scout. So perhaps this game was played before the last one. Um, so we might see less mind games and more of a pure style. But let's have a look. Um, as once again we see, just uh, just says with the exact same build order as the previous game. So he's gonna open up with that that quick adapt. He's gonna be going into straight warp gate stalker. Hmm. There's actually a funny thing that Zest does, which I, I do want to draw the attention to. Which I, when I first saw it, I was like, huh, this 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 timing on his, uh, what you call it. Uh, on the chrono boost on the stalker I thought was very weird um, because it starts a little late and Zest does something that almost no other protos does where if we look at his chrono boost usage 
he puts a chrono boost on his main nexus before the natural is done, which makes sense because it's still gonna give him more mining, but it's something a lot of people don't do because it gives you an incomplete chrono on a stalker. So what we see is the moment the second pylon finisher is about to finish, he chrono boost on this probe. Um, so that's a chrono boost even before he uses this on his first gateway unit. He'll have a chrono boost available for that. And then he starts rallying down into the natural already with these probes. Um, I guess he builds a, a twilight first. But then he doesn't have chrono for his second gateway unit. So he needs to wait for his natural to finish to then get the chrono on the stalker. And he still does that because it's important. So this stalker might be what, six, seven seconds in. So it's gonna be three seconds slower in the end. Um, and he's gonna have slightly more minerals because of that, which I thought was a really cool play. And it's something that I definitely want to be doing. It's just my habits for so long has been that I use my first chrono boost from the natural to use on this. And it just feels like wasted chrono energy. But in reality, it's actually, I think, just better what Zest is doing here because he gets minerals earlier and minerals earlier is always better than having minerals later. So um, just a little fun thing that you know you, you might want to incorporate. Of course, this is mainly for higher level players. If you're if you're in in, in, in diamond or, or below, then this kind of stuff isn't going to be too interesting for you as the main thing is just getting the build order right. And, uh, these kind of minor details are usually the things that people at lower levels tend to get caught up on. Uh, it's like, man, I saw this in one video or I saw this in a build order guide and the guy said it was really important. But a lot of these things are not going to be that important. If you are below, I would say, master, master one, majority of your attention should be spent on, on getting the DT drop or whatever build it is you're doing at a benchmark similar to the person you're copying. So that would be, in, in this case, this could be something like 435. I think it's the, the timing we, we usually tend to with a triple DT drop. So you pause the game, the moment he warps in his first three DTs, I guess 432. Finishes at 435. Okay, 435, you press the, the unit button and then you just write all of this down. So you see 42 probes, three DTs, four adepts, one stalker, one prism. Um, he is supply blocked at 6262. He has a pylon on the way and he has four gases and he has 55 minerals and 39 gas in the bank. You write all of that down and you go in a game against the AI. And you just start practicing the build order until you get as close as possible to this. And you'll notice that within the first three, four games, um, you're gonna make the most progress and anything after that, usually the prog progress is gonna be very marginal it's going to be a s small percentage increase of doing it better but the first few games are the most important and i would always want to do that into in a in a controlled environment like against the ai um, that's where you want to be making your build or your mistakes people always say well i want to always stress test it immediately but that's not how it works you first want to test whatever it is you have in a stress-free environment because if you can't even do it in a stress-free environment you're just going to be wasting your time putting it into a stress test um, and I know a lot of you guys don't have a lot of time to play StarCraft, so if you only have a couple of games a day you want to you want to improve, you gotta be as efficient as possible. And, and and that's the way to do it. Just by making sure you have your build orders down before you take them into a, a stressful environment like the ladder or maybe even a smaller tournament that you wanna play in. So this time, um, if if we think back of last game, we remembered um, those first three DTs doing a lot of damage, right? Getting that hatchery. A bit of a weird trade where he lost like five DTs, I think three DTs, one Archon, um, killed a hatchery and six, seven drones. This time the trade is a lot more minor. He kills nine links, I assume it is. Eight links and a creep tumor. <laughs> um, and he goes straight into an Archon drop. So we immediately have a change of pace. Remember when I said last time where Zest was gonna be going into charge? I said it's probably because he realized his opponent is gonna get less gas because he killed his main hatchery or one of the yeah the main hatchery um so a fast spire is most likely going to be out of the question now in this case that's not going to be out of the question and as a response Cest is going to be getting blink i know that because i actually did some preparation for today which is also a first thumbs up for preparation um we have a forge going down um, 
these double archons, you know, just it's still similar concept from that last game, right? We have this this prism flying around. The only thing that this prism needs to be more aware of now is that there might be a timing where mutalists are out, and of course you don't want to be losing that prism. Um, so it's just flying around, and you see how happy. Well, I'm not sure how happy he is. I, I don't have a camera on his face, but. I imagine Seth smiling as he clears another creep tumor and kills another Ling or moves another Overlord out of a position where it can see stuff. Um, because this is really all that Seth cares about. He doesn't give a crap about killing 12 drones. People always ask me this kind of stuff with, with builders like, hey, like, how many workers should I be killing with this? And it's like, well, the answer to that is as many as possible while keeping the units alive. But people focus too much on killing the units and don't think about the extra task that something like a small drop can do. Um, whether that be clearing overlords or clearing creep or just controlling a path towards your base, making sure that you're not being attacked. Now, you see a recall being used. This is around the timing for Aspire to finish. So it is possible that Cest is anticipating Mutalisk. It's also possible he just really wanted to get rid of that Overlord. It's it's difficult to say uh, with Zest sometimes because he's he's kind of a wild player and doesn't really care too much about a lot of things. Yeah, and as we see, we just see him go across the map again. Um, typical Zest. So we do see a blink follow up here once again in preparation for that Mutalisk. I actually think this move out is really dangerous if you don't have a recall. I wouldn't recommend that around this timing anymore if you're not fully aware of what tech your opponent is going which Zest isn't so this is one of the plays i'm not that big a fan of honestly maybe there's of course a possibility that he knows that su doesn't like to play mudas um, but as, as a general rule i wouldn't suggest it so once again we see Zest kind of heading into heading into storm uh, increased immortal count we see added gateways um, Everything's pretty much par for the course here, right? We just seeing pretty much what we expect. The difference with last game is, however, that we see a higher eco game for both players. So we see 81 workers for Su getting up to those eight gases, and Sess needs to deal with that in a different way. Like last game, his main focus was basically getting a fort base. Then the moment Su moved out, he would counterattack. Now this time around, because Su has such a nice economy. An attack by Sue is a lot less likely. It's still possible that Sue does it, but most of the time it's gonna be more like uh, like small little cuts. So he's gonna try to cancel the fort base with some links. He, he might do a baneling drop. He might do a baneling run by. Um, he might send three roaches around to clear a couple of probes. You know that kind of stuff. We're seeing a Sue that is a lot more concerned about his follow-up attack, and that means that Zest needs to switch gears because Zest can't just be defending on three bases, and we see. A little bit too much defense on three bases here we see zest expecting a push by su which is a mistake so he's gonna scout now with a hallucination and he's gonna get the shock of a lifetime when he sees eight gases he's gonna see a high run and we're most likely gonna be seeing some some type of move out where um says like oh crap there's a hive already that's not good i mean he does have blink but right now it's like well i, I guess i do need to do something he's gonna get a fourth base behind this so of course the brilliant player is, has something ready and this is really th the main mistake that Zest has made this game is not scouting these gases and thinking that it's gonna be the similar game as last game uh, or it's gonna be the type of game as last game where it's gonna be lower eco and his main priority is gonna be defending all this investment into defense into batteries into a massive wall templar at home all of this is completely useless in the face of fast broodlords of 85 drones. Um, you can always get these cannons later on if you're very afraid of runbys, but this was a defense prepared for a 68 to 75 drone zerg, which Su simply wasn't. It's a very different type of game where Zest misreads the situation and then gets into a situation where all of a sudden he is the one that needs to be attacking, and now he's the one getting counterattacked. So, where last game, we're, we're basically seeing a, a a complete reverse of the roles here, where Sue is like, okay, I'm building up a way better army, and Sest is like, oh crap, I need to do something. I don't have the eco to support a late game switch. I don't have the, the units to really support a late game switch. Like, he didn't have the setup for it. And that's an issue. Now, you can easily see how this game could have gone different had he scouted better. Um, 
he could have perhaps taken a way faster forward base faster eight gas and then this push could have been way 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 more Archon focused or there could be more storms where he could be going into extra targets now as it is of course this is still a powerful push that Su uh, needs to keep in account but um, th this is this is much this is very similar to to that last game of of Zest, but then the, just a the role reversal where as long as Su holds on eventually he feels like he's gonna win and, I mean he just clears Zest's army here but there's still a lot of cool takeaways in this game right we have that initial harassment again we have um, the ability for him to move out this time he got the blink in case of the mutas and we kind of start to it, it, it in in video games um, if you ever play video games which I'm assuming most of you have, you usually have a, a bit of a, a, a dialogue tree, right? If you ever played, uh, I, I, I can't even think of like World of Warcraft. I'm not sure if it's in World of Warcraft, just any game. Usually when you, you met an, meet an NPC, they have like these, these standard responses, right? You say X and they say Y, you know, your input is A, their, their output is D, whatever. You kind of want to see StarCraft in a game like that. And if you can figure that out for yourself, this kind of, this dialogue tree with its different branches, um that's very useful but what's even better to do is not having to do any of the work yourself and just looking at a player like Zest, who's obviously one of the best and going like you know what how would i copy his dialogue tree but instead of it being dialogue it's just responses to different things so his response for example to killing a hatchery is to go charge instead of blink um his response to seeing a low eco zerg is going to be to get a non-committal fort base and setting up a lot of runbys around the map um, th these are all things that are very easy to copy and you don't have to think about it all you need to do is realize what's happening and it's a very important skill to understand why something is happening uh, in a game of Starcraft why a player is doing something that makes it a lot easier to copy but even if you don't quite understand it a lot of the time it's still good to copy top players um, because in your with your experience with that build or with the style you might be able to slowly but surely explore that, that tree with its different branches of reactions to whatever your opponent is doing. So imagine you have absolutely no clue and you see this first game of Zest and you see him just constantly doing these counter attacks and taking non-committal forward bases against the style that Sue played this game. That probably isn't the greatest, but then you figure that out after one game and you look at it and you go like, hey, maybe what could I have been doing different? Maybe I should have taken a faster committed forward base again when I see eight gases or when I see a fast hive. And these are difficult things to realize and it all sounds very easy when I tell you because you know I already thought about it and quite smart um, but yeah j just try to try to think of this kind of stuff when you're looking at replays or looking at top players if you want to improve if you don't want to improve and stay jerking off and just watch for fun um, otherwise don't forget to smash the like button I love you all very much don't forget to subscribe to my youtube channel there's socials up there i also have an instagram account which is not up there for whatever reason but it's down in the description i appreciate it if you all follow me there i post by week by yearly content on my instagram so high level stuff any other videos down here down here have a look at that see you all next time bye bye